Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land. In this video we're taking a look at Mark Antony's Friends Romans Countryman speech part two. So without further ado let's dig in shall we? If you're tuning in to get an explanation of Mark Antony's Friends Romans Countryman speech and you want to start from the beginning and you're not aware of it, I will put a link to the first part of the speech right here where we go line by line through it. But in this video we're going to carry on line by line through the next section of Mark Antony's speech. Now the speech itself almost comes in three parts. In the previous video when we looked at the start of the speech you'll remember that Mark Antony was speaking to the mob who thought that Julius Caesar was guilty and deserved to be killed by Brutus and the senators. And Mark Antony, when he gets given the chance to speak, is told he mustn't say anything against the conspirators. Um, and that's why he, he started by saying, you know, Brutus is an honourable man and I came to bury Caesar not to praise him. But by the end of that first section of his speech, He's put doubts into the minds of the audience that Brutus and the senators are actually telling the truth. And he certainly undermined the idea that Julius Caesar was ambitious. So taking that prop away from Brutus leaves the audience in doubt. And they're ready to hear Mark Antony carry on his speech, but he would finish by just saying, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. And so they're touched by how much Mark Antony loves Caesar. Something to watch for as Mark Antony carries on his speech is how he avoids directly condemning Brutus and the senators, but still manages to whip up the crowd to revolt and to avenge Caesar's death. So let's go into the reading, shall we? So we're in Act 3, Scene 2, and we're around the line 120 mark. So Remember, Antony has just paused to weep over Caesar. The plebeian crowd is touched and awaiting in sort of an awed silence for him to carry on speaking. Let's see what he says. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, a nun so poor to do him reverence. We'll just stop there. What's he saying? He's saying literally, just yesterday, when Julius Caesar was alive, he could have stood against the world. He's the great emperor, the great dictator, you know, with his legions that conquered Gaul and which conquered Pompeii. He's, he could have stood against the world. What a great man. But today, there's none so poor to do him reverence. In other words, the meanest, the lowest person in the world won't even do Julius Caesar reverence now. He's that despicable. And there's a suggestion there is, how can you go from that great to that bad in one fell swoop? It's not right. And we have to remember that Mark Antony has enumerated some of the great things that Caesar has already done for the Roman public. And so now he's talking about this great contrast. He could have stood against the world now none so poor, while well, he's talking to the plebeians, none so poor to do him reverence, to show him respect. And you can see how this touches Mark Antony. And you can see how, as these words go into the mind of the, the listeners, whether they feel they are doing an injustice to Caesar. What we're going to see now is some great rhetoric in which the power of suggestion and insinuation is used to tell the crowd what to do without explicitly saying it. This is unbelievable in its eloquence and in its manipulative powers. He says, O oh masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honourable men. So let's take it line by line. So, oh, masters, he doesn't call them plebs, he calls them masters, because Rome should technically belong to the Romans, not just to the senators. So he's putting them, you have the authority to judge whether Caesar's death is right or wrong. But did you notice the power of suggestion? 
if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, well, mutiny and rage is revolt, it's riot. If I, if I wanted to tell you to revolt against Brutus, Cassius, the ones who put Julius Caesar to death, oh, I'd be wrong because they're honourable men, this ironic honourable men, which he's said many a time now, for Brutus is an honourable man. But he's actually saying, isn't he? Get in your minds the idea of mutiny and rage, because I'm going to undermine your confidence in Brutus and Cassius and all the other honourable men. What a clever little twist, this power of suggestion. Now notice what he says next. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honourable men. Do you get the import of what Mark Antony is doing here? He is calling the crowd wrong. You are wrong, I am wrong, Caesar is wrong, but the senators, they're oh so right. In fact, when he says, I will not do them, that's Cassius and Brutus, wrong, I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you. He's saying, our society is better that we be wrong than they be wrong. I choose to wrong you even though you're not guilty, rather than wrong those honourable men. They must remain clean. They must remain honourable in the eyes of all others. He's creating an us versus them. He's actually insinuating that Julius Caesar and the people that Caesar had looked after and other ones on Caesar's side, like himself, they're lower than the senators. The senators live in their own little ivory towers and everyone else is subordinate to them. I would rather wrong the dead, Caesar, wrong myself and you. Now that makes it personal. You are better off being wrong than them being wrong. That's a devilishly clever way to turn the crowd to start turning for mutiny and rage. That Brutus and Cassius are right and we are wrong. They've duped us. And now Brutus brings forth something and tries to drum up emotion and eager interest in what he has to say. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. So, if I were to try and encourage you to mutiny against the senators, I'd be wrong. If that was my motive in talking, if I came here deliberately to raise mutiny against them, I would be wrong. But actually the reason I've come here is because I found this parchment, it's Caesar's will. So it's not me that's saying anything now. This is Caesar speaking for himself. And he's dead, he says, let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory and dying mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. So what's he saying here? This is amazing. He's saying, I found this will. If you were to hear what this says, oh, by the way, I don't intend to read it. I mean, that's deceitful, isn't it? He's, he knows full well that by the suggestion that Caesar has something to say, the crowd will want to hear what Caesar says. But he's saying that if you heard it, it would change your minds completely. It says you would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds. If you heard what was in this will, how much he loved you, you would kiss his wounds right now rather than rejoice over them. You would dip your napkins in the blood, beg a hair of his head, take a tuft of hair, so that, he says, when, you, when you're dying, you will mention it in your wills. It will become such a prized possession to you. This napkin was dipped in Julius Caesar's blood. This is a piece of Julius Caesar's hair. It's so valuable, it's in my will. And it says, who bequeath it as a rich legacy, so a family heirloom, to his issue, his sons and daughters. 
If you knew what Caesar had in this will, you would want to get a piece of him right now, do reverence to him, homage to him, and save something of him because it would be the most priceless thing that you could possess. And you would pass it down from generation to generation, the blood of Caesar, the hair of Caesar, anything that touched Caesar. But I don't want to read it. I don't want to stir you up to mutiny and rage. It's better that we be wrong than those honourable men be wrong. Can you see the manipulative power of rhetoric? And by the way, the lesson in this is that rhetoric is used a lot today, but people are so ill-informed about it, they are easily led. People, most, most watching YouTube would say, that can't happen to me, but we are manipulated by words all of the time. Why should we study Shakespeare? because he gives you the insight into the greatest use of language. Now listen to what the plebs say. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. Oh, you see, they want to know what Julius said. He's got their attention. They're already doubting that Brutus is an honorable man. Julius Caesar's got a will. What's in it? Oh dear. We may have been duped. We'll hear the will, Mark Antony. Read it. After all, they are masters, are they not, of, the, of Rome. Rome is theirs. Antony says, Have patience, gentle friends, I must not read it. It is not meat, you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Whoa. Can you see what Antony is doing here? He's deliberately brought the will up, Suggested I didn't want to read it. I don't want to come here to stir you up But if only you knew what was in here Oof. And they say we want to read it now. Did you notice have patience gentle friends? This opposite to mutiny and rage to a riotous uh, clamorous mob you are gentle. I Mustn't read it It's not meat. Um, it's not proper or right that you know what Caesar said now, why does he say that? He says, you are not wood, you are not stone, but men. You are not unfeeling material. You are not statues where you can simply hear the words and they have no effect. It says, and being a man, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. You're not made of stone. You've got feelings. If you heard what Caesar wrote and how he loves you, it would stir up your emotions. But did you see the power of suggestion again? He didn't say you would feel deeply for him. It says, it will inflame you. Ah, the call to riot, the call to revolt. It will make you mad. He does not want the crowd to hear it and feel sorry and self-chastise. He wants the crowd to hear the will and become inflamed and mad for vengeance. What a brilliant use of the power of suggestion. He's, he's sort of implicitly telling them, when you've heard this, you need to revolt. Let's carry on. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs, for if you should, oh, what would come of it? Now this again is brilliant. They could be like, well, maybe we shouldn't hear the will. So Antony gives them a little snicket of the will, just a little teaser to make them want that will when he says, it's good you know that, it's good that you don't know you're his heirs. Oh, they've got an inheritance from Caesar. They're even more interested now. You just drop that in. It's, it's good that you don't know you're his heirs. And why does he say that? Because, well, if you knew that and how much Caesar loved you, what would become of it? Again, this insinuation that the honourable men, Cassius, Brutus, the conspirators, they are in the right, you're all in the wrong. They killed Caesar because he was ambitious. But hang on, Caesar has got you in his will. He loves you that much. Where are Brutus and the senators? They're serving themselves. And the plebs response? Read the will, we'll hear it, Antony. You shall read us the will, Caesar's will. So, he's cl so they're clamouring now. Anthony says, Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? 
He's basically saying, well, just slow down, be patient, stay. That doesn't mean stay around, it means stay, hold, you know, you stay a horse. Wait, I didn't mean it to go this far. You shouldn't know about this. And then he says, I have oh, shocked myself to tell you of it. I've gone beyond what I should have said. I'm just so wound up emotionally in my love for Caesar, I shouldn't have mentioned this will. Oh dear, oh dear, what have I done? Is what Mark Antony is saying. And then he says, I fear I wrong the honourable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. Now, how amazing is that? From part one, we saw how he made an irony out of Brutus is an honourable man. He's not an honourable man. In fact, he talked to about reason fleeing to brutish beasts, suggesting that Brutus was a beast, an animal that killed Caesar. And now he says, I fear I wronged the honourable man, which is exactly what I didn't mean to do. I said that earlier. And then, instead of just leaving it honourable, now he adds the crime to their name, whose daggers stabbed Caesar. Now the assassination wasn't done for Rome. Now we've got an act of murder. And it's hit home on the crowd because the plebs then say, they were traitors, honourable men. The will, the testament, they were villains, murderers. The will, read the will. So he's already got them to turn on Brutus, Cassius, the senators. He came, he hasn't said anything explicitly bad about them. He said, I don't want to wrong them. They are honourable men. And yet, with through the power of suggestion, you know, I would not stir you up to mutiny and rage. If you heard the will, it would inflame you. It would make you mad. If you heard it, what would become of you? What would happen? He's already primed them to revolt and told them, when I read this, you know what to do next. And yet they are getting all that under the radar. So what does he say next? Antony says, you will compel me then to read the will? Of course, Mark Antony is not being compelled. His whole aim when he got here was to get the crowd to turn against Brutus and Cassius and the like. But what he's saying is, you masters, remember he called them masters, you choose the fate of Rome. You tell me to read the will. Is it your wish? Then I must obey. And then he says an unusual thing. He says, then make a ring around the corpse of Caesar and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Now, this is a very noticeable almost ritualistic thing that Mark Antony does now. He creates an air from rage to solemnity around Caesar. Um, you have to remember Caesar would be deified. Now, he says, make a ring around the corpse of Caesar. Well, of course, that means all come close. But he's going to use Caesar as a bit of a prop, okay, with the next part of his speech um, in a brilliant way. But the idea of a ring, it has multiple connotations. He wants to come and join them, he says. As a ring, that means we are united as one. The ring has no beginning and no end. It also is like the matrimonial ring, the wedding ring. We are bound in loyalty to Caesar. He's like our dead husband. Let's come around and weep over the grave of Caesar. And did you notice, he says, let me show you him that made the will. So he's saying, I want you to come and literally see the person who made the will, Julius Caesar, his corpse is there, but let me show you who he is. I will really reveal to you the kind of man he was. And that final bit, shall I descend and will you give me leave? So he's now saying, let me come amongst you to join the ring. We're all united as one. And will you give me leave? This asking of permission, whereas Brutus gave a speech earlier in which he announced why Caesar had to die, that was the senators taking the lead. Here we've got Mark Antony saying, will you masters, remember he called them masters, give me leave? And their response, you shall have leave. A ring, stand around, stand from the hearse, stand from the body, room for Antony, most noble Antony. 
Nay, press not so upon me, stand far off. So he wants a bit of room for them to watch. And then they say, stand back, room, bear back. So there we have it. This is, Antony has now moved into the final part of his speech. He started in the first part, in my first video, where he challenges the idea of Brutus actually doing something noble for Rome, but actually doing it for personal gain or jealousy of Julius Caesar. In this speech, we've just seen Mark Antony instruct the crowd, subliminally almost, to revolt. Remember that he said they would be inflamed, that they would be driven mad by hearing Caesar's will. And now he's got them um, calling the senators traitors already, that they are not honourable men. And that was achieved through Mark Antony's use of irony. And now they are one. Mark Antony is amongst them. They are around Caesar. It's almost like a religious rite. And he's going to now raise the crowd. They're primed. He's going to raise them to act and turn on the senators. Just before we finish, I'll read through what we did in this video. But of course, at the end of part three, I will deliver you the entire speech so we can hear it in all of its glory, its majestic rhetoric and eloquence and brilliance and persuasiveness. But let's just read through now what we did in this video. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there and none so poor to do him reverence. O oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honourable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honourable men. But here's a parchment. With the seal of Caesar, I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this statement, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. They would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory and dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. The will, the will, we will hear Caesar's will. Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stone, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs, for if you should, oh, what would come of it? Read the will. We'll hear it, Antony. You shall read us the will. Caesar's will. Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have oh, shot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honourable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. They were traitors, honourable men. The will, the testament. They were villains, murderers. The will, read the will. You compel me then to read the will? Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? Will you give me leave? Can you see how he is wrapping them up to mutiny and rage? to inflamed passions and madness of spirit. What brilliant rhetoric. You've got to love Shakespeare. So that was Friends, Romans, Countrymen, Mark Antony's speech, part two. And next week I will be doing part three and we will go through the whole speech in one go and we'll see just how majestic the rhetoric is that Shakespeare puts in Mark Antony's mouth. And let it be a lesson to why Shakespeare is relevant today. Until that time, I wish you joy in your reading.